Welcome to the class Computational Neuroscience, Neuronal Dynamics of Cognition. Last week we have looked at the Hopfield model. This week I will start from Hopfield model and add several generalizations which should allow us to go towards biology. These generalizations can be all classified as attractor models and of course I will explain what this means. So last week I used the Hopfield model as an example of a model where it's the interaction between the different neurons that perform a complicated computation, such as finding the closest prototype. And I wanted to convince you that you can find the closest prototype without a central processing unit. Now, if you think about the Hopfield model, it has nice aspects, but it looks like a very special case. You have neurons that are either pointing upwards or downward, plus or minus. You have symmetric interactions. We have looked at random patterns. So there are many directions in which we can generalize. And the overall aim is to go towards biology. So last week we looked at a Hopfield model as an example of a Hepian assembly. You store different patterns. For example, you can store the apple in a set of neurons that are active together. Later, you may want to store a banana in a different set of active neurons. And of course, we don't work with images. We work with random prototypes and we said that the probability of a black pixel is 0.5 for each of the patterns. So we have several of these random patterns, several prototypes that we store in the network. These prototypes are once fixed at the beginning and that means we chose a certain rule for picking the weights and implicitly the patterns are encoded in these weights. So we have different patterns, for example pattern 1, we have black pixels, we have a couple of white pixels, 50% black, 50% white, we have uh, a second pattern, we have a third pattern, and we can compare the momentary state of the neuron, which is black pointing upwards or white pointing downwards, with one of the patterns, for example pattern 1. And then this comparison gives rise to the overlap. But we can also compare one pattern with another pattern. And this is just like the overlap measure, is the correlation between one pattern and another. Now in the special case that you have orthogonal patterns, these correlations are always zero. So if you compare, there are as many pixels that are the same on both sides as there are pixels that are different on both sides. That would then be an orthogonal pattern. So to make it really orthogonal, in this case, I have patterns here that have as many black pixels as white pixels and as many same pixels across the two patterns as non-same different pixels across the two patterns. Okay? So this is an example of an orthogonal pattern for eight neurons. So what have we seen last week? We have these interactions, then we have the total input. I take these interactions and multiply with the current state. And this total input is passed through a sine function and this gives the output of this neuron i at the next time step. And then we did a little calculation to show that summing over all these different inputs is in fact related to the overlaps. Let me just redo this calculation. So the weights are given by the patterns. I sum over all patterns, pi mu, pj mu, and I will always use a normalization constant 1 over n. So the whole thing is the definition of the weights. And then I copy the sum over j, I copy the sj of t, I put in the brackets, and this is the sine function. And now let's look at this. I have here a sum over j, pj, sj, but this is just the overlap if I include the 1 over n. So all the red stuff gives the overlap with pattern mu at time t and then I copy the rest, sine function, what remains is the sum over the patterns pi mu m mu of t. So the sum over all these different neurons j is equivalent to looking at the overlap. I have the overlap on the right-hand side. 
And on the left hand side, I have the state of the neuron at the next time step. But the overlap itself in the next time step will be a sum of all these different neurons. So I can hope that this gives rise to a mapping from this overlap at time step t to the overlap at the next time step. And this is the central idea that we are going to exploit in the following. So the overlap in the next time step is again the sum over all the neurons in the next time step. And for example here overlap with pattern 3 is pj3 sj at t plus 1. And suppose we start here at time t, then the overlap with pattern 3 in the next time step might increase and might increase further and we approach a fixed point. So the dynamics of the network as a whole is attracted towards a fixed point and this attraction towards a fixed point is characteristic for a attractor model. Of course we want that the fixed point sits at a relevant state. So the fixed point here sits at a state with a very large overlap equal to one for orthogonal patterns and deterministic neurons or very close to one in other cases. So let me summarize. Attractor networks, that just means that the dynamics of the network as a whole moves towards a fixed point and this fixed point is relevant. This fixed point represents the recall of one of the patterns. For orthogonal patterns in the Hopfeld model, we found last week that this fixed point sits at an overlap of one, which means perfect retrieval of the pattern. Of course, if I load many, many patterns into the same network, I have this additional noise term caused by the random walk. Uh, so that the overlap might not be exactly one, but in any case it moves towards a fixed point. So this concept of attractor networks is much more general than the concept of the specific instance Hopfield model that we saw last week. And it's in this context that we will look at different generalizations of the Hopfield model in the following lectures. But before we go on, let's look at the following quiz.